Um, so hello everyone. Um, just want to welcome everyone to what is uh, first and what we hope to be a series of service seminars. Um, you know, on our calls and stand-ups, you know, we run into a lot of interesting service-related topics and questions that are raised, and we don't always have the time to step back so we can understand the different solutions and techniques that um, either help or include our goal of designing a student system that can be tailored, expanded, and integrated among a bunch of institutions. So if everyone else can mute, that would be great. Um, so anyway, while we were organizing this first session, we received a lot of interest from people outside the services team uh, who wanted to listen in and attend. Um, so we decided to open it up. And um, that really shouldn't really come as a surprise um, to us because uh, we have a lot of, you know, the potential of quality student writing on its service design. And it's probably the piece of the system that I think is one of the biggest enigmas, you know, to both functional and technical people alike. Um, so we thought, you know, we'd begin on our first one by looking at, you know, some of the reasons why quality student chose to use services and how they can be used to solve um, tough integration problems. And in this case, we're going to be looking at uh, Boston College's implementation of curriculum management and their current effort to implement uh, course offering, course registration, and uh, KSA. Um, and so we'll probably also hear, you know, from Norm about, uh, you know, where the services are falling short uh, in that effort as well. So let me start by introducing uh, Linda McCarthy. We'll talk briefly about her plans at Boston College. Uh, I know a few months ago she said to me that uh, she wanted to cast a very wide net, and, uh, and she wants it fast. And we were just simply to let her know if something she wanted wasn't possible. And frankly, this is where a service-based architecture should, should sing. Um, and with a growing number of institutions, implementing institutions like Boston College, uh, I'm expecting to see, you know, more demands placed on the services, more expectations in terms of their capabilities, uh, consistency, and flexibility in the service contracts. But anyway, um, let me uh, uh, hand it over to Linda. Hey, Tom. Hi there. All right. So, so I'm going to answer two questions. What are we trying to do, and what are our issues? So. What we're trying to do is replace our 30-plus-year-old system and do it component by component. Um, so we did an assessment of all the different components that we had, and then we did a risk assessment looking at what was the most risky thing that we had and what order should we do them in. We then looked at the Kuali roadmap for the components and married those two together to come up with our plan. So for right now, we're looking to implement KSA and um, start to plan for course offering, registration, and academic record. And so for KSA, we're looking to go live in March of 2015. And for course offering, we're looking to go live November of 2015 in preparation for registration that would happen in, in March. And sprinkled in there, we've got all these other tasks that we need to kind of accomplish. We have part of our academic record is able to generate an electronic um, transcript, and other ones we can't. So we started talking to Norm and Tom about creative ways that we could use the academic record to um, – take care of some of those issues that we have going forward um, and kind of say how could we use the current structure of the academic record to handle storing of data to create a transcript so that we ultimately can do an e-transcript. How can we use the academic record to store some information that our, my users are currently putting in FileMaker Pro or um, AppX databases, things like in the, our professional schools, School of Nursing, School of um, Ed, where those students go and do student teaching or nursing, and we need to kind of track all of that activity. It's part of their coursework, but we cannot capture that in our current 
our current SIS system, and then the certifications that are around those uh, those types of things. So one kind of thing that we've talked about because we're really into KSA is we're trying to do things even though we are as we replace it component by component we have to go back and sometimes we have to retrieve data out of our old system because that's the source. Sometimes we need to supply data back to the old system so other components can keep um, running. And so what we're looking to do is capitalize on the Koali services and try to design, even if it's a temporary integration, um, design it the way it would be when we go to um, Koali students uh, for the whole thing. So anything else that somebody wants to ask me or I'll turn it back over to Norm and Tom. Hey, hey Linda, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, this is Sri from uh, UW. Uh, hi. So I had a, I, I chatted out, but probably you haven't seen it. Uh, I was wondering, is there a wiki or some place where uh, somebody could follow the enhancement that BC will be uh, working on? Yes, as we go through it. So we're in the analysis phase right now, and we do have a, a wiki. And we're so for KSA, we're working with um, Sigma to identify what the gaps are and which ones we will address um, and in what order. And we're doing the same thing for course offering. So absolutely, we can share that um, share that info as we um, as we gather it. Most Thank of you. That right, right now is in the Boston College Wiki, which is not, right. not yeah. available. But so right. what we want to do is to pull pieces of that out and, and uh -huh. put it over on the Quality Student Wiki. And yes. I've actually done that for a couple of pages that, that I sort of knew that were, were general of general interest. But I understand what you're getting at. Is maybe there's a broader way to do that. Yeah. For example, you know, if you tackle any academic record or program or uh, stuff like that, you know, just to understand. If, you know, what enhancements are being worked on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and part of what I also want to try to do, too, is reach out to um, Kuali partner schools, to to see if something that we're doing is going to be, inter you know, of interest to somebody else. So trying to figure out how that, you know, maybe that is someplace up on the Kuali wiki that we kind of have, like, a sharing page of, of ideas. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to take it, Norm? Sure. Okay. So I, I'm still going to try to talk as, as if I'm talking to just the services team because that's sort of what my, my plan on this was, and I wasn't going to try to make it any different. Um, so you just have to excuse me if I sort of just, you know, sort of talk a little tech a little bit more than you, you might sort of expect when I'm usually talking. But I'm just going to try to roll through this a little bit. Um, so, so one minute, Norm. Did you start recording? I, I don't record. I don't know how to do that stuff. So. I am recording. Nothing. Okay. Okay. So the the very first problem that that um, you know we're faced with here is, uh, and, and and Linda was the one who identified this right on early. Is what are we going to do about rice? Um, you know, we only want to have a single rice instance running, um, but but we have a, a problem in that it, we've got different um, applications that we're building. Um, where we're trying to deploy that are actually being released on different cycles so that, you know, KSA was built on, as you can see, on the 231, but CM we're running right now on 220, and, and enrollment is, is right now the founders release we're working on is 232. And so sort of how are we going to sort of resolve all that? Um, and even going forward, um, you know, there, there are just some issues about how do we get all the pieces to work together because we know that we're going to be taking, um, you know, KSA, and it's unclear whether they're going to upgrade to uh, RICE 241 at all, um, or whether just they're going to continue working on their KRAD screens right now and have it have it work. But it has to work with a standalone version of RICE out there, um, and so we we've got to explore all that. And, and it's it's and also you know CM when we get CM uh, 3.0 released. Um, you know, is that going to be working on the same version of Rice that when we release the next Founders release of enrollment? Maybe, maybe not. I just know we were we weren't we were told that they that they were going to be released independent of each other. Um, maybe there can be some serendipity that they'll work together, but we just wanted to make sure that we could actually still just have one Rice 
and, um, and, and have that rice be the rice that we're going to work with as a standalone. Now, what, what we find is that, so now we're talking a little different, is that we're going to be needing to maybe have, for example, KS run, KSA still running the KRAD version of rice that is 231, but it still needs to talk to the, the standalone rice for its identity service and its, and its permissions and roles and all that other kind of stuff. And so we need to make sure that we can get the two, the, the, the two separate servers to talk to each other. Um, and then I just wanted to point out that we have this workflow application that's also being done where they're doing things, um, where they're building workflow applications to do things like, um, uh, what is it, the big one that they're working on right now is the... Rec the sabbatical um, request form? Request. Yeah, that's it. I knew it was started with S. So they're doing a sabbatical request form. So as you can see, there were, there's a lot, lot of activity going on, and we're going to be putting, pushing a lot of pieces um, out the door. So, so that's, that's our first big problem. We're like, excuse me? So, so the first question is, I mean, and, and it's, at least as far as I know, we haven't been able to do this. Have, have people been able to, I'm, I'm getting echo on here. Um, have people been able to even run a, um, you know, a, a KSA embedded against, a, uh, that's running at 231 RICE against a RICE uh, standalone that's running at 241? Um, and, and as far as I know, nobody's tested that kind of stuff out. And similarly, you know, our, our current CM is talking actually to a RICE 220, so we know that works. But if we upgrade to 241, which we think is the, like the latest one that we're going to try to settle on, um, it, will the 220 actually work with that? Um, without, I mean, we don't want to have to change anything. Oh, I'm sorry we lost audio is anybody else there i'm here tom yeah Hello. we're all here and we hear you fine it's just not norm okay are you back norm can people hear me um, yeah, we lost you for a while. Oh, okay. Somewhere in the previous, or on this slide. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll put my, my microphone closer to me, and maybe that'll help. Maybe won't, or I'll slow down a little bit. Um, so then I know when I get going, things freak out. Um, so so we've just got to try that out. But but then if you look at that, that the problem with rice is actually just a, a, a miniature problem that we actually are facing globally, which is that if you actually look at um, enrollment over here on, on the left, if you can see this here, you know, it's using a lot of the services that were defined and are currently running in, in, in Boston College's production CM2.0 system. You know, it, course, program, clue, ATP, learning objective, learning result catalog, organization, Proposal, message, document, comment, enumeration, um, and then the old statement service still going on. And so w when we try to deploy these things, we're saying to ourselves, can, how are we going to do this? And so what we really want to be able to do is, um, is make it so that we can keep CM2.0 just as it is for now, right, but possibly run um, enrollment, but change it so that the enrollment is actually pointing to these embedded mode, the, the, the services that are actually being served up by CM2.0, right? Because that's really the, 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 the sort of the system of record or service of record for course program, clue, ATP, et cetera. Um, and, and really, the, just the enrollment services, academic record, course offering, learning unit instance, you know, course reg, and these ones down here are the ones that, that are really part of enrollment proper. Um, and, and so, so we're looking at how do we how do we make it so we can manage all of these things and 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 have them actually talk talk to each other and talk to each other in, in real time as we're doing. So, um, and then if you look at KSA, it still has that problem too. It needs to talk in terms of ATP and comment, and then but in role services, it has this hold. It has to talk to the hold service, and and um, and then there's this the shared ones which I don't even have to, to figure out, which are the, the fees and rate services. So there's a lot of complexity here. And so the, the, the solution 
that um, we explored. You know, we looked at it and said, well, geez, do we just load data back and forth? Do we try to, and I'm like, going, no, you know, we don't want to do that if we can help it. If we, if we have to load data, then it's not really real time and it's not really, um, you know, using services the way, way they were designed. Um, and we can also leverage the, 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 the fact that, you know, even though things like rice, the internals of rice may change, the, the, the contracts to the rice identity service, I don't think have changed since the, you know, the two, big 2.0 release that they did. And hopefully they, they're, they have some governance around them. And we know for, for a fact which of the services that we are actually knowing and what we need to change in the CM stuff. And so we, we know how to actually manage the, the changes in services, and they're more stable than the actual underlying implementations. So, so that, that, that's what we're trying to leverage here is that the, the contracts themselves are actually more stable than the implementation, so we don't have to worry about we can, you know, managing the other changes. We just have to worry about the, the, the uh, changes that are going on in the contract. So I was going to be showing it working, but unfortunately, I messed up my database, and it's, <laughs> I showed it to Linda the other day, the two weeks ago, showing all this stuff working. Um, but so I'm just going to jump now and just to start showing showing some code as to way how we actually make it. We can make it so that these ser separate servers can actually talk to each other. So I'm just going to jump into code a little bit here. Um, so yeah, uh, ba 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 ba. So the the first thing that that I did is sort of said, well, what what we need is an implementation of the service. And so in this case, it's the ATP service. And I don't know if people can actually see it. So we need to have something that implements the, the ATP service, and it does it by, by calling the decorator. By extending Nam, the are, we, are we supposed to be seeing, looking at code now? We are, are looking, at, looking at code? No. I am not. I don't know about others. I, I can see it. Can you see it? Can you see it now? I am looking at your first screen. One tries to rule, rule them all. Oh, gosh. Then something's frozen. Yeah, I can, I see, can the code. see your screen. Yeah, I can see the code, too. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'll rejoin. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. So, so what you really what we what we wanted to do and and um, is to set up a an implementation. In this case, we're calling it ATP Service Remote Impl, and basically it extends the standard decorator. So then we can just override the methods that we care about, and all it does is is it shells out by by calling. And, or calculating getting the an ATP service on a port and setting that as the next decorator. So if you're familiar with the decorator pattern, you know, what we do is we set the next decorator. And what we, what we end up doing is this time we're just we're reaching across the web service. We're configuring it with a, a host URL. And so you, what we do is we'll, we'll configure the, the service with a host URL, and that will actually build all of this all of the, the actual ports and factories and stuff like using SOAP. Like, like we've always talked about, I mean, we have the services, and they're SOAP services. It's just that nobody's really been using them that way. Um, and so this is, this is a way we're actually, you know, using them. We're actually pointing across, across the wire now. And so when I say get ATP info um, or get ATPs by ID, it's actually calling the next decorator to get them. Um, so... That was the, the plan, and so I, I did this, and I found at, out one problem that we ran into, which is that if you actually call the services over the wire, SOAP's JAX-B renders an empty list as null. And if you remember, one of the service um, rules is that, you know, if you have a, a method that says get ATPs by IDs, it should never return null. It should return an empty list. And it either throws an exception or it returns an empty list. Um, and so what I ended up having to do for anything that returned re returned um, no, uh, returned a, a list of something, I, I ended up wrapping that and checking if the list actually comes back null and then returning an empty list instead. And you can see I sort of did this on, on all of the methods that returned a list. Now, if, if any of you know me, you know me well that, that this is exactly the kind of coding that I can't stand doing repetitively. Um, and so if you look at something like clue service and you, you sort of see the same exact structure here for the clue service and you go down here and you say, oh my God, it's all the same thing. It's the same check. Because what I was able to do was 
I was able to generate these remote impulse based on the service contract. So what this, what I've got the ability to do now, just using the contract generator thing that we have, I was able to cre actually create the run, a, create a mojo that will create the these remote impulse automatically, um, and it and it does it. Uh, what I found was that they work perfectly, it, with one except with a few exceptions, and the exceptions are um, where we didn't actually we didn't our, our where our um, services, our service artifacts didn't follow our own standards. So, for example, there were some of these things where they didn't have the uh, a clue service constants out there, or they didn't, you know, in the ATP service constants. And so I had to go and I had to fix the constants files and, and clean up the constants files that, that are still out there that don't have, that aren't following the pattern that we're supposed to be following. Um, but that's kind of a neat thing and that if you generate something based on the pattern and you end up getting something that you see something that um that no law that doesn't follow that pattern and it's broken and so it forces you to go back and fix the fix the pattern um so we're able to i was other than that i was able to i can we can generate all of the services that we need and in fact um i just did these ones because those are the only ones that i wanted to do in my little proof of concept for for boston college um but it, you know we could just extend this thing and and run the the generator for all of that so so that's the remote info but then you say to yourself oh i need to configure the thing too right and so the next thing you do is say i don't know about you but i hate the spring beans configuration it's always just hard to do and how to get it get it right so what i what i did there was if i can find the other sources is that right yeah so what i did is i cre i actually generated the the configuration too so i created a little xml file i mean the the contract doc generator you can see here it says remote service screen bean writer it'll write this screen bean and it talks about how you how to do this and how to do all the configuration and everything and so it, it, it builds this little atp service exporter and so what you can see is that this is the standard you know exporter for for quali student service bus and so what what you can do here is the service is really the ATP service, but the ATP service is now the remote impl that we've just defined here. So you have the remote impl, and it goes there. All right. So the next thing, of course, is that you know, typically in Spring, you you configure the thing and you can set a property. And I told you it was the host URL, but we have a problem in that in that in in our you want to be able to not hard code this host URL in the actual system, uh, in the actual source tree, we want to be able to make that a, a, a config option instead. Um, and so what I did is I set up a, a structure here that you can specify the, the actual, and this describes it in, and it's part of the, the generated documentation of how you can actually put the, the QA server in a QA config file that's on the QA server and you can have it on your local server um, or, or you can have it on the prod server and you can have th so they can have it so that it, that by the using the you know the quality student config file you can point you can have that instance of this remote impl point to different different physical servers so um, you know that was needed in order to actually really deploy this thing so I just wanted to show that um, so that's the next piece of code then what's this um, oh so, so this is just a so just this is a little project that I've got, and it's in what we call the Boston College contribution area. And so what we're hoping to do is be able to contribute this remote server, these remote services, back to the to the branch into a tools area. We haven't really started the discussion on that yet, but the hope is that we can take these things and, and then once they're done, we can contribute them back, and then it should be easy to sort of maintain and manage them over the over the long haul. Um, but then. What I realized is that it really needed a real live example showing showing this to how to work. And so I created a remote services example project too that shows how you actually can configure that kind of stuff and you can get the pieces, you know, a spring that you have the spring beans and everything. This is um, an example of, of actually how you do it. So you can just import those other pieces and how it overrides all of the, you know, your, your your standard spring beans that you might have for enrollment, but here you're then overriding those resources and putting in, you know, the the remote ones. 
then it makes it easy to sort of like create a, a new deployment. You know, this is just a deployment. It doesn't really have source packages in it. It's just the configuration stuff. So it's easy to make a configuration, uh, the deployment that's a configuration um, that overrides and points to these things as remote, remote services. Um, so just wanted to show that. Then, so when I started actually doing this and putting it out, and I, I wish I could show it, but um, I, I, found, I ran into some, some problems. And so what, some of the things that I had to do uh, when I was actually trying to run it was that we had a lot of searches that were defined in, in, uh, in enrollment against the CM services. Um, and so I had to sort of ma manage that and make, make sure that worked. Um, and, and some of them were bug fixes, which were, which were great. Um, but in some other situations, we, we, we found that um, some of the searches were, and I'm, uh, were sort of gratuitous. They, they, were, they were using searches when a, a service method would, would work um, just as well. And so I had to end up, you know, cutting over and, and moving that sort of code over into the CM implementation and making sure it all worked over there, which was, which was kind of not, not fun. Um, the bug fixes were fine. It's one thing sort of saying this is a later version of the code and we, and it, we've got some bug fixes in it, but these other things, um, were, were, were more problematic. And I'll just say, say an example. It was like one of the things, one of the searches, um, they used, somebody had coded a search to get the, um, the, the list of academic years, um, from the ATP service. So they used a, a, a named search to do that instead of just using the set of the, the method that says, get me the ATPs by, by type, um, where you say, say academic year is the type. And so you end up getting, you, you, would, you got the list back. And I, I'm still looking, I'm saying, why was the search used in that case instead of just using that? Because there's not gonna be more than 100 academic years in the system, um, that's not gonna be a performance problem. And I know we went through and we did a lot of searches for performance problems, but that can't be a performance problem. Um, it's 100, 100 rows at max. Um, and so even if you sent all of them across the wire, uh, which, which we weren't even weren't going across the wire, that would have taken like, you know, a second. I mean, just we're not talking a lot of data. We're not talking a lot of stuff. So I, I think that, that, that sometimes we, we overdid using searches to, to get data. And sometimes, you know, we need to actually sort of slow it down because searches, these name searches are actually mini contracts. They're, they're agreements. And if, if we just start throwing these things all over the place, you end up with, um, they're agreements between the front end and the back end. And you end up with a back end that, that can't, that you have to then suddenly implement this other thing, this other search. Um, it's as if you would add a new, a, a new method to the, to the contract. And suddenly the contract that you, you, you thought worked doesn't work. And, and that's okay, but you end up, it, it makes it harder to sort of um, do this kind of bridging that I'm doing, I'm talking about. So then I wanted to show one last thing, which, which showed um, um, a little bit more complicated stuff that I was able to do um, and what we had to do to get this to work, which is this um, course service generic format adapter. And so in Boston College, when, they, when, when we implemented CM, we did not... Um, we did not, we purposely chose not to implement formats and activities because in Boston College, they're not really part of the canonical. It, to them, to get the course approved, they, they don't specify any of that stuff. Um, I think UW does the same, does the same thing. Yeah, other schools actually specify the, the, you know, the, the formats and activities. And so we needed it there, um, but it, it really isn't necessary um, for certain schools. And so I was sitting there going, well, what's the best way to have this work? Because when we get to enrollment, um, it sort of has an assumption that, that when you create an, an activity offering, it needs to find the, and, and line up and match to the corresponding activity. And so I'm sort of scratching my head on this and going, okay, how can we make this, this work? Um, and so, you know, we have a couple options. One, again, we could, we could change the Boston College implementation and say, um, well, you have to have uh, formats and activities and just create them in the, in the database there. And I'm going, but again, well, why? They're not needed for anything. So instead, what I, what I said is, well, you can sort of 
add what, what I'm calling a core service generic format adapter. And so what it does is it, it sort of sits on top of the, the existing core service, right, a decorator. And what it does is for every course that it gets to, that it runs into, it adds a generic format and activity. So as you can see, if you say get course, it gets the course, you know, from, from the actual course from Boston College's system, but then it says, oh, add, add an activity to that course info object. And so if you go here, it'll oops, go up here, and it basically says, oh, if there's no formats, then create a format and add it into it. Oh, and then you don't have any activities, add an activity to it. And then right now, I just put in um, act, a lecture, but the, what I was going to be doing eventually is have a, a, um, a generic we have to define a generic activity type that would allow any kind of um, offering, activity offering type that would go with it. Um, so this was really cool and it, and it worked, um, except uh, it worked for the basic thing. I could allow them to select and match and I was, you know, it was moving along pretty well. But somebody wrote a search to find the activities. And I'm talking about it was it was a not these uh, search fours, but one of the those type searches I was talking about to return the list of activity types that are for a course. And I went, oh, because, you know, given a course, the cost of actually getting just those list of activity IDs, again, if it's cached and when you're at offering time, we can cache the courses. It should be super fast to, to fetch a course because it's already been cached. Um, and then just to rip through it and find all the activities that match should, should be very fast because it's all in memory. I mean, again, if you're not searching and finding, you know, having to search millions of records, then, you know, or at least thousands of records, I mean, you're not getting any performance improvement if you, if you add these searches. So I, I wasn't able to complete it complete. It wasn't complete because I, I, we now have to sort of like fake out that search and have it return, you know, the, this, this generic activity too. So it was a little bit frustrating there, but as you can see, this would allow us to, from from enrollment standpoint, it would look at the course offering with this little adapter on it, with the course stuff, and it would every time it asked for a course, it would say, yeah, and Boston College courses have a, a generic format and a generic activity on them, and that's it. Uh, and then the rest of the the CM, I mean, the enrollment offering, the course offering stuff, should should work from that on. Uh, so. That's sort of what I was able to do. So I was able to put these together. Um, let me see if I can talk a little bit more, and then I, I'm going to sort of stop because this was, uh, again, just wanted to show off and then ask, have people ask questions a little bit. But let me go back to the presentation. Adapter, yep, yep, caching adapters. Oh, and again, like I said, caching adapters. A lot of the performance problems was cool because now that we've got um, stuff, I'm going to go back up here if I can. Where is the page up? Oh, we'll go there later. Um, if you can, people see this 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 right here. So, what I'm I didn't hear anything, but I'm hoping people are saying yes. Um, with a yes. caching adapter, what's really kind of nice is that you could actually put a caching adapter here on this side. Whoops, uh, page up on this side of the uh, of the wire. Whereas, so people, other people ac accessing the CM services like internally or from, or other, this one here, if you need it, if you need it without an ad a caching adapter, you, you don't have to put it on. And so if, what, what I wanted to point out is that even when we're going over the wire, if you put a little caching adapter here, you, you still get almost, you should be able to get the same kind of performance as if you're all running locally on the same machine. Because, and it's really neat because it's the, it, the, it's the person who is, consuming the service that knows whether or not best, whether or not it needs the freshest data or it could live with 10 seconds old or a minute old or an hour old. And so the idea of having a generic caching adapter all running on CM for anybody else is kind of ludicrous because you would still have to go over the wire for it. All you're saving is the, maybe the database lookup. And so the point is, is if we separate these things, we could put caching adapters here, we can put them here, you know, we can put them wherever we want to speed up whatever we're after. So, um, so that's that's the basic outline that we're talking about doing. And again, we got it proved out that we could actually do this. There's more stuff to to 
to, to finish, but it it's, it basically works. So you know, like I said, I had adapted most of the, the services that it needed over there. Um, but there's another sort of just thing I wanted to show, which was which we, you know we don't know if we have time to explore all this because there's a lot, but it, it certainly would make make a lot more sense in many ways is is actually to run the whole Boston College implementation in, in this model. Um, and here, sort of what I'm talking about is that you would have a bunch of services running headless without any application on top of them, and and then you would run the applications without any services directly attached, not running in the same you know, Java, JVM, and that they would always be talking across the wire to get whatever they wanted. Um, so if, if we, now that we can actually prove that we can easily talk across the wire, like, like quality students always said we could, you know, it's good that we actually are showing that we can, um, it, it might be worthwhile to actually try to, to do that in a, um, you know, in a full-blown sense, because that way, you know, we'll know where really the performance issues are for doing this and or if we run into other issues like that, the Jacks B marshalling and unmarshalling problem. Um, and what, from my perspective, when I look at this, what I like about this model here is that you can, you can then choose to, to cluster and run the services that you want to run together. So, for example, you might want to run all of the rice or you would Actually, we would not gonna, we're not going to touch Rice. We'd run all the Rice services all on their own in the Rice server. But we could, we could then say, well, do we actually run all the CM ones together, or do we peel off and run, a few, run for example, if we have ATP over here in CM, which I didn't list, maybe we should run academic record service over here with this server, um, because that's really where it, where it lives. It's running on that, sort of that, that, that main cluster server um, instead of on enrollment, just because the academic calendar, I mean, the academic calendar service was designed um, and implemented as part of enrollment doesn't mean that, it, that, that the academic calendar service, you know, needs to be part of enrollment. I mean, it's really, they're separate applications here. Um, and so that, that's the idea. And, and, and you, that way, the, the idea here is also that you can, you could spin up if, you're, if your service is shown to be the bottleneck. You could actually spin up, you know, multiple servers of the course implementation of the course service um, to to handle the load, or vice versa. If, as we've been finding, that the problems don't seem to be in the services, like um, some people presume that it happens right now that a lot of our performance issues are in KRAD, um, you could also spin up multiple versions of the application without having to spin up multiple versions of the underlying service. You could keep the underlying service. You know, at the level that it needs to be at, without um, without without affecting the application. So you could have, you know, for example, if you're if you've got a really heavy demand for course registration and whatnot, you could spin up ten ten of those course registration servers and maybe do that dynamically during registration and then spin them down um, as needed and it completely independent of the of the back end ser uh, services that are running. So um, that's where we're at right now. You know. Don't know if we're going to have the time to actually explore any more on this, but it's um, to, to me it's, it's kind of neat to be able to actually see see us using services in that kind of a cool way, where we're running things um, not not all joined together as you know as uh, as if it was one giant stack. So that's what I've got for my for my presentation. Do I have questions, issues, thoughts? Come on, services team. <laughs> so I'll toss something in there since it's quiet. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about um, how BC is going to connect KSA and enrollment? Oh, that's another thing. Yeah. Well, let me let me show it here. Right. So here's here's KSA and enrollment sort of talking to each other. Right. Or that they have to talk to each other. So it, it, the, the the quick thing is that um, enrollment has to alert. There's really a sort of a thing in the middle here. It has to alert the fee management service that's in KSA that there's been a change. And so. 
what we're going to be doing is, is you know, having a, a, a callback service that says, hey, um, it'll detect a change in registration and, say, and it'll send a little um, message back or a little, uh, little call back to this thing that lives in the middle that says, hey, this thing changed. And so that thing in the middle will, will sort of hold, hold that um, or it'll meet for a time being, depending on, on how it's been configured. Um, hey, Norm? Yep. Are, are you supposed to be showing the diagram that you created for us? I, I, that would be a good idea. I didn't, I didn't put yeah. that in the, in the, in the stack, but uh, let me switch out and do it. That's a good okay. idea. So let me. I didn't know if my screen was frozen and I was still on that. No, I just didn't. Let me see. I have it here, right? So, uh, I forgot about that. That's this one. This was, was okay, say. Fee management service integration. There we go. Hey, there we go. So, okay, th this sort of shows it a, a little bit, little bit better here now. So, this diagram sort of talks about how in the end state, you know, when we were all, when, when Boston College is all on um, Kuali, this is how it sort of would work. A student would register and when that, regi that, when that course registration service, you know, processes that, it would then alert this callback listener, right? And it would say, hey, there's a, um, th there's a, uh, a change to this student and this term. And so that, that ID and term would be queued. And at Boston College and I think at other places, the people might, not, might or might not want to run that in real time. So you can see there's two different pathways. One, the callback listener could just call this sort of what we're calling glue code over here. Um, but other cases, it may just sort of put it on a, put it on a, a, a queue of some sort, and it would sort of just hold, put it in a holding pattern there. And then at some point, the, you know, the bursar or somebody, whoever's responsible for saying, now we want to assess tuition on everybody, it would release those, those, those IDs and terms. Um, and what's nice about this is it gives us the opportunity here to coalesce the, um, like if the student made three or four changes to their, to their registration, they should only get that, the, the assessment done once. And so it allows it to sort of like, you know, de -dup remove duplicates from the ID and term sort of list there before it sort of sends it on within that time frame, whatever time frame you're, you're holding and releasing them on. But then what, what has to happen here is that there's this, like I said, this little glue code that has to fetch the data and it actually has to go back. I don't have a line showing it, but it actually has to go back and grab the data from, let's say, the course reg service and populate the, the structures that are needed for the fee management service. Um, and so that's that way, the fee management service would then assess the fees and it would post it to the student account. And I, and I just want to show the, the other alternate path here, which is if somebody wants to get a preview of what their tuition and fees would be if they submitted this card, they would actually talk directly to the fee management service, pushing in the, what it is that they're, per, they're talking about registering and then assessing it. But instead of posting the account, it would go back with the, what the tuition would be for, for that set of courses that they have. Um, so from a Boston College standpoint, you know, that's the end state we want to be in. But at Boston College standpoint, we, we, we want to um, come up with something that, that works, that we don't have to completely redo. So what, what's going to happen here is that students are going to register, um, and they actually don't register for fall and spring. I, that, that's a mistake there. They just do it for fall. Um, but they, they register, and the mainframe would record this. This is their old existing system. And it would send it to their operational data store, we think. It would be sort of an equivalent. And then we have a process that we've already written that was able to take data from, uh, from the mainframe systems in, in, in the storage in those process and create, um, store that data in the academic record service. Now, Boston College's um, tuition and fees you know, don't don't have uh, don't depend on lots of the detail that are needed for uh, like like for example, depending on exactly what section you're in, it depends on what course you're in. Um, and so, what we're going to be doing here is storing it in the academic record service, which is at, which is at the, you know the sort of that higher grain grain level, um, and then have a process that selects the IDs and terms out, and would then the glue code would format the data and and make it call into the and the fee management service. But the idea being here is that 
is that we're able to reuse the academic record service and the, the most of the glue code that we would eventually have to use here so that we, we can get this done quickly. Um, so this page out here, I, I copied this page over to the Quality Student Wiki. So if people want to see that, um, you, you, we can get the link for that. But this is this was something I developed for Boston College and then and then posted it over there. Does that answer your question, Tom? Well, yeah, it does. Um, and so you're also using academic record in a different way than I think was originally thought. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, so this thing is going to be used to, to create transcripts, and it's also going to be used to, to generate fees and tuition. It's going to basically become the, the system of record for the student's academic record, which, wow, what a surprise, right? That's what it is. Norm, it's Carol. Yep. Um, why did you choose academic record instead of course registration in order um, for, for the fee part? For the fee part. Again, because um, Boston College's rules don't require, so for example, unless, Linda, you're going to correct me on this, we don't, um, we don't charge, uh, you know, differential uh, tuition based on um, things like, your the date of your registration so they don't if, if they do charge a late fee or a late drop fee and all those things like that they they it happens so rarely and they just do it manually um, so they don't do it like automatically so uh, the reason why you know originally in Kuali student we're talking about using that is because a lot of schools said that they needed that that detailed information of like exactly when they registered because they assess Late, late charges and things like that, late registration fees, if they, if they don't meet certain milestones and whatnot. Um, and, and similarly with, with down to the detail level of, of each section. So if you have a, a, a fees that are associated with one particular section but not another section, um, you'd need to be able to go directly to all of that raw detail about what happened. Um, as opposed to what what Boston College does is they basically charge you on what you ended up getting into, not so if you add a course, drop it, add it again, you don't get charged for partial times and stuff like that. It's basically they they said in fact ninety ninety percent of the students at Boston College um, receive uh, you know are charged just full tuition just based on their enrollment status. They're an undergraduate. You're you're by definition you're charged full full tuition regardless of the courses you take. And, and trying to wrapper the course reg service, which is much more complex than academic record, um, against the UIS mainframe seems a lot more problematic. Course reg is a very complex service, whereas academic record is pretty straightforward and the mapping is pretty straightforward. So. Hi, this is Kathy. I had a question for Linda. I'm here. Okay, so um, how how overall, you know, what do you think your your sort of risk areas are with this? Is you know, I mean, I realize that was part of kind of what drove you to a decision, but this is obviously very aggressive and very exciting for the community. I'm just wondering, you know, how how you're feeling about it overall. Um, I am looking, we're, we're trying to come up with our risk mitigation. So I guess my thinking is that the most risky part is if Kowali student doesn't deliver the functionality on the timeline. Um, so part of what I do is keep reminding people this is a draft. You know, we're going to kind of march down that, you know, this path and, and um, see how far we can get. Um, I think what it allows us to do is do it in bite-sized pieces, which mitigates some of the risks because yeah. people are looking at things and starting to get used to it. So one of the things we're going to do for course offering 
Um, we roll, as Norm talked about, we roll the courses over once a year, not by semester. So this fall, when we do it for the hopefully last time in our mainframe system, we'll also do it in um, Kowali student and kind of make it as a proof of concept. Yes, we could get all our data in, we could do it, but also to start to have people see and how different it's going to be from what we do before so that they're not in a panic when we actually do it for real. And they're sitting there thinking, oh, God, we can't do it this way. We can't do it this way. So I think there's there's pluses and minuses to it. Um, we, you know, everybody knows that that's where it is. And curriculum management went well, um, you know, and we've also got in our roadmap to do the, the curriculum management upgrade to get the KRAD screens. Um, we know for KSA and for course offering, we're going to need to go in and make changes to curriculum management or add things to curriculum management. So it, it allows us to continue to do it in a modular fashion and not have the big bang where we're, we're impacting large, commu uh, large um, group of the community members. We're kind of segmenting it into different layers. So, Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So that, the other question I had is, uh, so right now in BC, is your uh, source of record the, I don't know what your legacy system is, uh, uh, legacy system or uh, you have, uh, I know you have CM is in production, so is your source of uh, record coming from CM? Yeah, so the course record would be coming from CM, that's the, the, uh, the course description. And the rest of it is on a mainframe system that was homegrown. So registration, so at the point when we have KSA running, students are going to be registering in our mainframe. So the mainframe is the source of um, the academic record for that person and the um, registration. So at what point along this plan, um, assuming it pans, pans out as planned, uh, is there a cutover or something like that, or is it going to be, uh, you're, going, you're going to continue to have a real-time ETL? No, we're going to cut over. So so the plan would be, so we've been pulling off piece by piece off the mainframe. So we're um, in the final stages of our Sigma Solutions for Financial Aid, the ProSAM, um, and Sigma Solutions becomes our, um, you know, source system. Our student account system will come off when we get to do registration. So once we have course offering registration and the academic record, Kowali student will become the the source system. And we have we don't our admission systems are already off the mainframe. So we believe that all we're going to use is to you know use the services to to do program enrollment. We our grading is happening through a, a, a portal service, so we'll kind of make a change to, you know, to that. So uh, our hope is that, um, you know, probably May of 2016 that um, we're starting to plan the, um, the party to unplug the mainframe. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think important is sort of as you see is that, so CM20 is now currently running, and we're going to roll out KS, KSA um, while CM20 is still running. And we're not planning on, you know, we, we don't, the whole point is we don't want to have to upgrade everything all at once just to get this going. So what we're, we're looking at doing is, okay, how is this going to work? We think what we're going to do is probably upgrade Rice first um, to 241 because we think that that's going to become the stable, least most stable version that, that everything should be able to talk to. Um, but we need to make sure that CM20 first works with that Rice. And then when we roll out KSA, it's got to work with that rice, even though it may still be running, and we don't know this, um, using the KRAD version from from its its old rice, which is two three one, especially as people just went through the KRAD changes that had to, you had to make um, when they when we upgraded to two four. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's if it's worth changing that right now. I don't know where you know that's got a, that's a big risk question mark. Um, and and so, but we need to, when we do that, then we suddenly go, oh, but KSA needs you know ATP and Comet and 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 uh, and actually you know some other ones here that are that are living over in CM. So we've got to make sure that still works because you know that's the home of the of the ATP service over here right now. That's the the system of record. And then then like we said, we're going to be you know, the to get the the um, the integration with the enrollment. You know, we're going to dummy it out with with academic record, but it's going to be the, basically the same exact path that we'll be eventually rolling out when we when we put this whole thing together. Um, and again, when we roll out course offering for that for that, that dry run that we're talking about doing, I mean, we probably won't have upgraded CM two O yet. Um, so we're going to do the dry, or maybe depending on all the timing. But you know, we need to make sure that. That that can still run with this one over here, or else we're you know we're not really using the real courses. So we're going to be saying we're going to offer courses, but not offer the courses over here, but not based on the real authentic you know system of record for what is what are the approved courses that's over here. So it's it, it's that kind of a problem that we're we're trying to roll out slowly, um, and then later maybe we'll upgrade to 3.0, but then these things should still be able to point to it all. So all the pieces should should still talk. So basically, Norm, it looks like you guys, you know, when you, know, you take a release of a module, you know, then you're slicing it up, okay. slicing and dicing, um, slicing it up on a service by service layer. Then right, well, we're actually talking about service by service, by group of services, yeah. By group of services. Um, and then figuring out, you know, how they're going to talk to each other. Are there, are there any things that you've found in the services? Um, I know you mentioned a few issues, um, you know, like reliance on search um, and things that were pattern breaks in some of the contracts. Are there other things that were impediments or you think are going to be impediments? Um, well, uh, the, the, the impediments that I'm seeing going forward is if we make uh, changes to the contracts. So again, they need to they need to remain stable. They if 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 we start making changes to the con, to particular contracts, then uh, what I actually I maybe need to test some of that out. W will the soap binding still bind? Um, I know we've done a, a couple of things to to allow it. Soap soap doesn't have to have the exact versions matching, but it has to be close enough. So in other words, I think you can add a field to to something, but if something's not using it, then that's it's okay. Um, and so the idea is, is we've got to look at it from that perspective is just make sure that we have some stability. And we know and we know one of the risks is that, you know, since all of these enrollment services have never been really formally released, they they're subject to change. Right. With, with, without as much with, with less governance or control over that. Um, and, you know, but sort of the hope is that they're not going to radically change. That's sort of what I what I was finding. Um, let's see. Anything else? As impediments, I, I think while you're thinking, while it, while you're thinking, Norm, a, a couple of things that's really important to Boston College and kind of uh, continuing my answer to Kathy for risk mitigation is um, making sure that we keep in contact with the services team and know if something is is going to change, um, so that we can, you know. Uh, adjust our course accordingly or, or make a, you know, make a, a change. And one of the other things I forgot to um, let people know is that we're also going to um, try to figure out how to do what Maryland is doing. So as the milestone releases come out, um, start to load those down too for a couple of reasons. So we continue to see is are things breaking as we go through this, but also allowing us to have a longer um, window and to the analysis of, okay, so now we understand, we think we know what we're going to do for course offering, but now 
let's start loading down the milestones for registration and seeing what that looks like and does that change any of, of our functional decisions that we're making? Um, does it change any of our technical decisions that we've made? Um, I did think of one other area that's a, that's problematic um, that that we haven't addressed right now, which is the the fact that CM2O currently uses the statement service, um, the old statement service to manage all of the prereq rules, um, but the course offerings leverage the um, the KRMS implementation a KRMS implementation. And so we're going to have to do some sort of bridge between the statement service so we can get the real prereqs that are actually on attached to the courses and then represent them as KRMS rules um, and do a translation sort of on the fly from them. And I, I, I haven't even looked into how hard that's going to be to do. Um, I do know that the uh, the, the original conversion wa was done by a South African team, and um, they did use the services to do it, but they, they did it, like, just on the reference data. And I said, well, that doesn't help an implementing institution, um, but at least it's done uh, in the serv at, from a service-to-service. -service. Like, they, they read the statement service, and then they write the KRMS services. So it is my hope that we should be able to grab that logic, and instead of r running it in batch, we should be able to run it um, as needed, like so when they ask for this prereq, it, it'll do the translation on the fly and, and return it as if it's a KRMS rule. Um, that's, that's my hope. Again, I haven't, I haven't gone back and looked at that piece of code that I need to, to, to shake out and sort of make sure that it really works that way. And we're also trying to figure out when we fit in that um, CM 3.0 upgrade. Um, my hope is that We'll have it done. We won't have it done in time for our proof of concept on course offering for this fall, but we hope to have it done um, by January, February of the, of the, the latest. Excellent. Yeah. So. Hello. Now, uh, regarding the statement to KRMS. I recently spoke to, not recently, a few months back, uh, to Chris Mann and Gordon, UMD. Yep. They gave me a brief uh, overview of how they handled it. You may, you know, whenever you're ready, you may want to touch base with them. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, this is more of a generic uh, question. Uh, what is your uh, team structure like, and how do you go about uh, deciding what to do next. Uh, um, well, we've got, we've got a project manager who also is sort of a, a business analyst. Um, this is existing. This is sort of, but, but Linda, you're going to be, you're, you're Oh, yeah. Oh, so I didn't know if it was the services team structure or my structure. So, yeah. So it's we, your structure, but I could answer the, what we're currently got. But. Yeah, I can tell you what we're doing here. So, um, so we'll, for each one of them, so for KSA and for the course offering or what we're like ultimately registration, we have, um, a different project manager, they're kind of um, intersecting because they both need to know what's going what's going on. We have a business analyst um, for each project. Uh, we have uh, right now we have two developers who worked on components of the um, curriculum management that will be a part of the team. Um, we will be hiring additional consultants and additional. Uh, full-time staff um, to staff that up. So part of what we're doing is um, as we do the finish the analysis and the planning and the uh, kind of phasing it out into milestones of what we need to deliver, when we need to deliver it, it um, gives us the timeline, the resources that we're going to need, and the budget for the, for, um, the various projects. 
And as far as how do we how do we sequence what we're doing, it again went back to um, original analysis on um, our various components and where the risk lied. Now KSA was um, was slated to be later. But with um, enrollment registration not coming out until this this upcoming January, we um, looked at um, the fact that KSA was delivered and said, you know what, in order to keep the team together and keep the forward momentum for the community, we slid KSA um, in place of um, of starting um, enrollment full force. So, and we also have to replace. We have a homegrown degree audit system. So, at some point in that process, we'll start looking at um, degree audit systems and bring one of them in. Thanks. All right. So we're a few minutes over. Um, any other last question? All right, well, um, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Norm. Um, I hope everyone found this uh, interesting and, and useful to see kind of, you know, we get um, so focused on what's the work that we do inside the project. I think this was, you gave us a very um, uh, useful view of, of how uh, the product gets used and, and, you know, some of the real world problems that you uh, have to solve. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll send out email once I get the recording link. And, um, hope everyone has a nice weekend. Thanks, Tom, for facilitating this. All right. All right. Well, take care, everybody. <laughs>